I'm going to um, introduce our work, Manage Stable Failures in the Wild. And this is a joint work between Penn State University, University of New Hampshire, and Twitter. So what are Manage Stable Failures in the first place? Let's take a closer look at the example of a retry storm. Suppose you have a database with capacity of 1,000 requests per second, and your initial load is 700 requests per second. All of a sudden, you have an abnormal trigger, such as background interference introduced by backup jobs. Your capacity temporarily decreased to 600 requests per second. And now your system is overloaded. And because of the overload, request starts to time out, and the retry starts. Suppose that your system, each of the requests can retry at, at the maximum one time. It can eventually lead to your load to increase to 1,400 per requests per second. And until that time, even after you fix the trigger, still the capacity uh, is below the current load and your system is overloaded. And this is metastable failure. So a takeaway from this slide is that metastable failures are a permanent overload even after the triggers are removed. And actually metastable failures are quite prevalent and they can lead to catastrophic events. So that, for example, Four out of 15 major outages in the last decades at AWS are due to metastable failures. And currently, um, system practitioners study them under different names, such as persistent congestions, persistent overload, uh, retry storms, death spirals, etc. And the recovery solutions we propose to them are also in an ad hoc fashion, such as load shedding, rebooting, adding more resources, and tweaking configurations. And our insight from this work is that these different looking failures can be characterized under the same taxonomy. And we hope our work will help people understand metastable failures better and in thinking about how to propose solutions to them. We start this by conducting a survey on finding metastability in the wild. We searched through over 600 public post-mortem incident reports, and we were able to identify 21 metastable failures ranging from large cloud infrastructure providers such as AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google, to smaller companies and projects such as Elastic Cloud and Apache Cassandra. Although 21 might, sound, might not sound like a lot, but they do exist everywhere, and they can cause major outages. From our survey, the outage uh, period varies from 1.5 hour to over three days, and with four to 10 hours most commonly. Interestingly, there are, there are incidents that were due to incorrect handling, and it further leads to future events. For example, engineers at Spotify trying to find out the root cause of their retry storms, so they add uh, more logging to the error path, which increased the average cost of each request, and it, in the end, generates more, more retries and exacerbated the metastable failure sustaining effects. So because all of this, the metastable failure is an important class of failure to study. Now let's consider about how to think about the metastable failures. Initially, your system is running in a stable state, which means that no matter how large the trigger is, you're never going to enter into metastable failure. However, when there's a load increase or capacity decrease, it can render your system to be vulnerable. Note that vulnerable state is not an overloaded state. There's no issue. And in, in reality, system practitioners would like to run their system in vulnerable state because um, it has higher utilizations and is a lot more cost efficient. However, when si your system is in a vulnerable state, a long enough overloading trigger can push your system to enter into metastable failure state. And there is a sustaining effect, such as retries, that keeps your system stuck in a metastable failure state even after the triggers are removed. It is not until that people took aggressive recovery methods, such as aggressive load shedding or server rebooting, to recover system back to the stable state. So, a distinguishing factor of metastable failures are there's a sustaining effect that keeps you in the metastable failure state even after your triggers are removed. Next, let's take a peek at the survey results and see how the triggers, sustaining effects, and the recovery methods appear in the world. F first, the triggers. We found about half of them are due to engineer errors. 
such as buggy configurations or code deployments or latent bugs, which are undetected pre-existing bugs. And about another one, one third are due to load spikes. Note that multiple triggers are also popular, with 45% presence in the instance that we found. Next, sustaining effects. We found load increase due to retries are the most common ones, with over 50%. There are also other sustaining effects like expensive error handling, log contention, and performance degradation due to leader election churn uh, in distributed coordinator applications such as Zookeeper. Recovery is usually uh, related to load shedding, and there are two types of them. One is direct load shedding, which people usually do throttling, dropping requests, or changing workload parameters. Indirect load shedding are also popular, such as rebooting to clear up the queues and uh, the backup logs, or policy changes such as disabling machine learning features, features to trade off accuracy for performance. Based on the observation of metastable failures we found in the wild, we can break this down into such a taxonomy. First, the triggers. We define the trigger as one or more events that can overload the system. And actually, they have two main types. One is the load spike trigger, which brings the load above the capacity of the system, and the system is overloaded. On the other side, we have capacity decreasing trigger, such as a um, background interference that could temporarily decrease the capacity below the load so that the system is overloaded. On the other side, we also have sustaining effects. We define them as a feedback loop that keeps the system overloaded even after the triggers are removed. And there are also two main types of them. One is the workload amplification, as we just saw from the retry storm example. When the trigger was applied, the retry starts uh, the workload amplification, and it, it has accumulated so much so that even after the triggers are fixed, the amplification continues and the system keeps being overloaded. On the, on the right side, we also have capacity degradation amplification, where, for example, a low spike can be the trigger, and it can trigger the capacity to degrade maybe due to, for example, garbage collections that's piling up. Uh, and it has degraded the system capacity enough so that even after the load trigger is fixed, it con the, the, application, the amplification continues to, to roll out, and the system is overloaded. So now that we have two types of triggers and two types of amplification mechanism, they can be combined to form the two by two scenarios. Note, note, that, um, note that multiple triggers and multiple amplification mechanism can also happen at the same time. But there are just superpositions of these basic scenarios that we show here. And in our paper, we have different instances and examples to show the effects, to show the details of each of the category. On the upper left, uh, low spike trigger brings workload amplification. We have common incidents from our survey due to retries. And on the upper right side, we have, we have introduced metastable failures in replicated state machine model using popular NoSQL database, where the slowdown serves as capacity decreasing trigger. And the retries serves as the workload amplification mechanism that keeps uh, the sustaining effect. On the bottom right side, we introduce metastable failures in a three-tier system with a web server front end, a look aside cache, as well as a back-end database. And the cache hit ratio drops serve as the capacity decreasing trigger. And because of the cache hit rate drop, the database was overloaded, and the application starts time out, and it cannot put the content back to the cache, which completes the capacity degradation amplification effect. On the left side, we also have um, low spike trigger, which introduced more garbage collections, which serves as capacity degradation amplification. You can find all the details in our paper, and in this talk, we're going to focus on uh, the last quadrant. We find the, uh, the metastability due to garbage collection originally at Twitter, and then we reproduced it in a controlled environment. And let's take a closer look at, uh, about the sustaining effect of this event. First of all, your system is running in a vulnerable state, and a low spike can bring the initial high queue length. And because there's high queue length, it leads to high GC behavior because there are more active objects to process during a GC cycle, as well as there's higher memory pressure that causes more GC cycles. 
And in our exper experiment, we can see a positive correlation between the Q length as well as the GC duration. Furthermore, the high GC behavior further slows down the job processing. This is because the GC can cause the application to pause and further slow down. We are, similarly, we also observe a, a positive correlation between the GC duration and application stop duration. And due to the job work slowed down, there's more queue building up, which completes the capacity degradation amplification feedback loop. So a takeaway from this slide is that the sustaining effect of GC is because there's a contention between arriving traffic and the garbage collection con consuming resources. And now let's put all of this in a nutshell and see how this happens over time. Initially, your system is running good, and the uh, garbage collection is low, and the queue length is low, and the low spike triggers high queue length and high GC behavior. And the queue continues to build up. Even after we did aggressive load shedding by reducing the load by 30%, the GC behavior stays high, and the, the queue continues to build up. We repeated this experiment multiple times and found that vulnerable state is actually not a binary choice, and there's a degree of vulnerabilities of systems. On the one side, system load determines the vulnerability, and here's a plot to show it. On the x-axis, we have the system load, and on the y-axis, we have the minimum um, trigger size to uh, trigger the system into metastable failure state. And when your system load is low, then you're running in a stable region, which means no matter how large the trigger is, you're going to be stable. However, when your system load is higher, you are running in a vulnerable region. And we found the higher your load is, the smaller the trigger is required to cause metastability. So essentially, there's a trade-off between efficiency and vulnerability. On the, side, on the other side, system configs also impact vulnerability. We experiment this by increasing uh, the maximum heap size, and we find even at the same system load and the trigger size, the system with a smaller heap size is metastable, but the system with a larger heap size is not metastable. This is because in a system with GC mechanism, larger memory reduced the memory pressure, thus lower the vulnerability. Now that we have seen the survey as well as the detailed instance, here are a few lessons we learned from this. First, we, it is possible to detect and react to the trigger quickly enough to avoid metastable failures because sustaining effects may not be immediate. For example, the timeout takes time to trigger the further retries. Also, sustaining effects takes time to amplify the overload. If your trigger is fixed and your system is not overloaded at that moment, then you, you are not in a metastable failure state. Second, we need to always keep sustaining effects in mind when designing systems and try to eliminate them as much as possible to avoid metastable failures. But this might, always, might not always be possible because there are many common op case optimizations such as retries or caching that can cause or exacerbate sustaining effects. So, so we want to minimize the sustaining effects as, mu uh, as much as possible if we cannot eliminate them entirely. And one of the examples we can do this is to consider the slow path, not just the fast path. We also need to understand the degree of vulnerability of the system to control risk. And we can do load testing to review the issues and adding capacity to lower the vulnerability. On the other side, system configs also affects vulnerability, and we need to detect and, co and control relevant, relevant configs to lower the vulnerability. If you got stuck in a metastable failure, I'm sorry, but you can still recover from it by doing these two steps. One is to fix all the triggers to prevent it from reoccurring again, such as negate low spikes by low shedding, rollback or hard deployments, or hard fix software bugs. However, end this overload, we, we, we need to end this overload and break the uh, sustaining effect cycle. And people usually do low shedding, such as admission control, to reduce the number of requests, or do graceful degradation to reduce the average cost of each request, as well as increasing capacity, or change the policy to reduce the amplification factors, such as reduce the maximum retry numbers. In conclusion, metastable failures are permanent overload that happens even after the triggers are removed. They are prevalent and it can cause major outages. Understanding the sustaining effects and the degree of vulnerability in systems is critical to prevent metastable failures from happening. 
We have built and open sourced three metastable failure examples for people to study metastable failures better, as well as propose and testing solutions to them. With that, I would like to conclude this talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks.